time it is. Hit the horn. I uh, hope you're as excited as I am. I am back. It is 1 p.m., the best hour of your week. Yeah. Oh, man, I have an applause button. I don't even have to get my, I don't even have to do the applause manually. I can auto applause. But I'm going to go ahead and give an applause because, you know, I miss not being here. Um, I like to be here. I love the stimulating conversations. And so, man, we're going to have a good one today. If you're reading in the chat, clearly it's going to be one of those. And as always, I have no idea what's in store. So this is going to be uh, very interesting as always. So I love it. But as you know, we have to have someone who is here more consistent than the postman. Rain, shine, sleet, snow, tornadoes, hurricanes, sharknado, Mark Boatwright, Frost. Hey, hey. How are you? I'm doing pretty good. It's, uh, it's Wednesday. It's tipping points and puzzle pieces. How can I not be doing better? Oh, man. Well, well, that's good. I, I don't know if it's cathartic for you. You know, sometimes you, you're a little angry. So if this is a way for you to kind of purge those feelings and recharge. It is, it, it's always, it's, it's not so much anger as it is frustration. You know, mm. you, you think about the work we do. The yeah. work we do is trying to bring people together. And we frequently, whether it is or not what we are actually seeing, we frequently interpret the response as apathy. And when you know that lives depend on it, apathy isn't what you're looking for. <laughs> yeah. Are and there it, days where you feel like kind of clubbing people like a baby seal? Oh, God, yes. <laughs> <laughs> Don't club them. <laughs> we, we need a club like Captain Caveman. Yeah. You're old enough to remember that cartoon, right? Uh, not one of the ones I'm familiar with. Really? Captain yep. Caveman! Yep. No, I um, I I was kind of blessed in a way. Uh, I grew up in Southern California, mm -hmm. and you had the Hanna Barbera garbage that was on, and then you had you know Bozo the Clown and Sheriff John and stuff, and so, which is Southern California stuff, Hobo Kelly things like that. But just about that same time, Raymond Chow and Golden Harvest started importing Japanese anime. And they they did translations loosely. And we started getting things like Speed Racer, Kemba the White Lion, Tobar the Ape Man, uh, Marine Lad. And these were Japanese animation. Which Star means Blazers. Star Blazers, yeah. Uh, Star Blazers, uh, yeah. Uh, Yamato, Battleship Yamato, uh, Captain Harlock. Um, and these are the things that I grew up with as, as a kid, as opposed to... And, and so you're trying to show me Hanna-Barbera stuff, and I'm like... Mm, yeah, I'll I'll be over here where the stories are actually good and the animation is fen is phenomenal. You love trivia. There is a live action version of the Yamamoto. Is that how you say it? Yeah, Yamoto. Yeah, Yamoto. There is a live yeah. action. It's actually pretty good. I have it's not seen it. Good. I'm gonna have to. If you find it, try to look for it. It's really good. Yeah, really good live action. Um, and there is a a updated version of Captain Harlock out there that I saw. That was oh, really, really, really good. It was like CGI done version of it. So it was a lot more realistic anime, more 3D kind of feel. Maybe in the last 10 years or so? Oh, God, yes. It, yeah. It's fairly recent. It was on Netflix, but it moves around between streaming uh, I, things. I might have seen it. I might have seen it. Yeah. it's it's It, it is a great view of the mythology of Harlock. So hey, did I just hear your stomach over your mic? Uh maybe. I don't know. Wow. <laughs> I guess why I just heard your stomach growl. Like your mic is excellent. <laughs> yeah. I'll have to raise it up a little bit so it's not quite so chest level. <laughs> <laughs> That's like, okay. Like, oh man, yeah, you, you need to you get a carrot or something. Yeah, actually, no, I'm I'm full. It's just it's been that kind of day. I've been running since early this morning. Um, okay, so here's what's going to happen over probably the next three months of Tipping Points and Puzzle Pieces. It's time to start talking about the projects. It's time to focus on the projects. Um, and since Monday, I finished submitting a grant to Kitsap Community Foundation for our Community for All project. And God nice. knows, who knows if we're actually going to get it. But uh, the grant was submitted. Um, 
on Monday. And if we do, it will allow us to expand our outreach for the Community for All project dramatically. It awesome. will take care of it will take care of being able to rent facilities. It will take care of uh, being able to provide food for events for mm-hmm. potlucks. It will uh, take care of a lot of the pieces for the community work that we're doing, and it will buy tools and uh, seeds for community gardens. Ah, all right. So. Um, None of the so I want to start off by saying that none of the projects that we do in the Kitsap Resiliency Project, and this would be a good time to put up the uh, the, the Kitsap Resiliency Facebook page uh, link I gave you. Okay. Um, none of the projects function without community for all. Without bringing community together, nothing else will work. Um, because it takes people working together to create the power to make things change between each other, between their their region, between the governments. Nothing happens without people coming together and making agreements. And we'll talk about some of the challenges of that in a few moments. But nothing works without that. Now, if you go to the, uh, the, the Kids Up Resiliency Project page, we post all of our events there. We give all our information there. Um, we will be post- posting the presentation that you'll see today there, so you can look through that. Um, Everything is here. And I know, oh my God, Facebook and and all of that stuff. But, you know, it's a tool. And we use this tool because it is the most effective tool of all of the social media platforms for giving a, 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 a good view of what, you know, of the information, the calendaring and everything else we do. That said. It sounds like you came around a little bit. Huh? Sounds like oh. you came around a little bit. Uh, no, I don't like Facebook even still because I have to be the one that posts things on it and it's a pain in the butt and they keep changing the rules. But to present to the public, to present to the people who are interested in our project, who want to create community, to who want to see a better future, it's a tool that is accessible to everybody. So, um, yeah. Um, Marwan just asked me if I could carry on without him. And yes, I can. Um, so we will, uh, we'll get into the power, uh, a PowerPoint in a moment, but let's talk a little bit more about this very soon. Uh, we will be, uh, putting up a page on mighty networks that is going to be the, um, kids have resiliency project page. It's going to be a place where people who want to engage can engage without having to deal with with Facebook and the algorithms. So um, that will be happening in the next month. We're working that out now. Uh, we will also be able to do classroom there. So uh, the workshops will be appearing online in the Mighty Networks. Uh, we will be having um, a, a face-to-face meetings in Zoom meetings there. So you can ask um, um you can ask questions about what we're doing. You can engage in projects. We will have project lists there and sign up sheets and surveys. So uh, once that's up and running, we will announce it and we invite you to join us and um, become part of the community that will create larger communities that will create a future of Kitsap that is more human centric and more equitable and supportive of everybody. So that's going to be the next uh, the next step of what we do. So, um, but you'll also see that on the Kids Up Resiliency Project page on Facebook. So please go there. Um, also, just a, a bit of a pitch: we are self funded. We don't. I mean, we just applied for a grant from the Kids Up Community Foundation that will go directly toward reaching out to you and helping support the community as a whole. Um, that will help us train people to go to your community and help you set up a garden so that you will be able to uh, be successful right away with that. We will be uh, training people to help your community connect and facilitate communications and create greater communities because we understand that doing it on your own is hard. So we still are asking people from communities to join us as a community ambassador or neighborhood ambassador so we can train you to do the work, but we will also be training people to support you. And that we understand is, is a key part of being able to grow communities together. So 
we'll talk a little bit about what the benefits are, but we are wired as human beings to have community. Oh, that's awesome. We just need to figure out how to do that again. And that's what we're working on. So um, I will jump into the PowerPoint presentation and uh, we will talk a little bit more about community. So let me uh, figure this out again and do this. All right. So uh, every week from this point forward, we will be talking about aspects of the projects. And each project aspect will probably take multiple weeks to cover. So each session will be a little bit different version of that. Today, we're going to talk about community for all. But again, I remind you that all of the projects, the power for all, food for all, water for all, communications for all, depend on us being successful with community for all. And so that's that's the key piece of this. So let's uh, let's move through this a little bit. That's something that we can use on the contractors. We've been all right. Two. There we go. Um, so to start with, and I'm gonna I'm gonna bring this to the forefront here. Um, maybe. Let's see that one. Yeah, there we go. Uh, bring this to the forefront here. This is the Webster's definition of community, and the first one. Uh, people with a common common interest living in partic uh, particular area, broadly speaking, um, is probably the most can I put together um, useful um, and then definition of this. But as you see, each one of these is a definition of community, but it's so confusing, and there doesn't seem to be one definition or one understanding of community. And that's that's kind of what I want to talk about to start this off. Part of the issue and the challenge is that we need to um, come to an agreement up front on what words mean. And let's talk about that for a little bit. Um, okay. So the problem with words and meanings. Now, I think there's the public school system like many of you did. And um, I say liars because it took me until I met a gentleman um, far after graduating from high school and having dropped out of college, quite honestly, um, who said that English teachers lie. You're the dead of English is a living language. It changes over time. And we've seen this. And sometimes it changes really quickly. Words tend to morph into other meanings. And so when you look at the dictionary, like we just did, it gets to be confusing because the same word can be used lots of different ways to mean lots of different things. And this is a challenge for um, communication, as you might guess. Uh, so English really doesn't have rules being a living language. They change The rules sometimes change. And even where you put a period may change. It hasn't yet, but it could. So we should think of it as guidelines, and they should be taught that way. So we already have a, a discussion about how complicated um, a word can be in understanding it. We've talked about the fact that words change over time and get adopted. Um, now we're going to talk about the fact that they get co-opted. And um, when we talk about co-opted, words get co-opted to dilute their meanings. And this happens a lot with corporate influence because the, the word... Um, can hurt corporate profits. The word sustainability is the most recent that I can remember of these things, where the word sustainability started being diluted and changed to mean a lot of things. And while, as many of you have already heard, I have problems with the word sustainability as a goal anyhow, uh, because it's too limited. But we change it and we adopt it and we greenwash it and we um, dilute it until it's meaningless and people can't hear it anymore because it's confusing. Okay. So these are one things that these are things that happen. So now you're starting to think, well, how can we even communicate when words don't mean the same thing, when they change constantly, when they get diluted and we have to come back to the point of there's no clear agreement on what a word can mean. So when I say something to Marwan and Marwan says something to me, we could be thinking one thing, but mean something completely different. And now we're at, at, at conflict with each other about what we think. Mark, that happens all the time. You know, I'm, I'm glad that you have this as a slide <clears throat> because not only does that happen, but 
Uh, you know, some folks are very, you know, hey, here's the dictionary, the literal meaning of this, this phrase or this word, and that's how I'm using it. Uh, but maybe the lexicon currently, they're using it in a different way. Um, and then so let me, I, I'm actually going to go back because we actually just covered that. Oh, did you? Okay, okay. Yeah, so this yeah, is the Webster. This, this, so I'm like, oh, this, man. This is, this is the Webster's definition of the word community. Okay. And it means a whole bunch of different things, and there's no one meaning. So when I say community, what are we really talking about? Facts. So, yeah, we, we, talk, we start talking about this, and then we understand all of this other stuff happens with words. And so how do we even possibly come to an agreement and create a community without taking the time for clear agreement, which often means listening to somebody else say something and then asking them about what they meant so that you can come to an agreement about what they mean. You know, one of the, uh, and I can't remember where this happened, so please forgive me. It may have been a, a college course. And depending on what the topic was for the day, our instructor, the professor, would give us vocabulary words and definitions so that we were on the same scaffolding, right. if you will, right? And so if you disagreed with the definition, then we could have that discussion. But for the discussion, when this word is used, this exactly. is really exactly. Powerful. So right here, um, you remember the word, and this may be too old for most people here, but there was a game a long time ago called Pong. And the idea is to use those paddles on the side to send the ball back and forth across the screen. And communication is a lot like Pong. You know, you hit the ball. It's bouncing off of different things, and it's the other person to see whether they can catch it and understand it or send it back to you, and you miss as often as you hit. So until you have a group of specialists talking, which is one of the definitions under community, it's the only time you actually, where they have agreed upon definitions, a small group of very narrow focus, you will actually have a conversation where things are understood, and even there you trip over each other. So the process is, the, my point here in this process is you have to relearn how to communicate to create relationships and community. And I would challenge people to look at what they do, wh wh how they communicate in a romantic situation and how you have mismatches and how many arguments come from those mismatches. A lot of relationships break up over text or email because yep. the intent, the, the emotion isn't isn't there yeah i did i ever tell you my rule that you intended yeah did i ever tell you my rule for communication no and it's actually getting shorter now um i used to have a rule that if i do three emails with somebody and it's obvious that they're not communicating i pick up the phone and talk to them you know in uh when i talk communications um one of the things that we were teaching was that you should not have in when you're talking about email etiquette right Mm -hmm. that you wouldn't have more than three asked in an email uh, because folks aren't going to be able to, to do all three, right? They're going to miss yeah. something. And, and people send long diatribes and it's just like, quite honestly, you send me a long diatribe that's not to the point and doesn't have, and, and, and doesn't have the, the, the something to get me to understand that the rest of it is important. I'm not going to read it. And I expect that from other people, which is why communication to other people is so important. But and culturally, I, that may be their communication style, right? Yep. Okay. So now we're back into familiar territory for this. So how do we overcome this, this situation? We find community or neighborhood ambassadors. We find people who are a caring neighbor or a caring person. They are driven to have a better life. They see a bigger picture. They have buy into doing something to create a bigger picture. They're willing to be trained or, more importantly, untrained, and they're willing to do the work, and they're willing to be persistent about it. So these are the people we're actually that I started off this conversation and we're looking for to go to their neighborhoods. We want to engage you in a process of unlearning and learning to communicate and then turn you loose on your neighborhood and this was originally you were the sole support, but now we're going to be developing more people to support you um, because we understand that it's it's uh, it's complicated. And sometimes the very relationship and the fact that you're a known quantity creates a problem in trying to commu communicate with people. So you'll have somebody to bring in with you to, to help facilitate the conversation. 
And so this is the this is where we're heading with with the community pro project. So now we'll talk about what that looks like. Mm. So yeah, Marwan likes my 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 drawings here as opposed to to text. So yeah, um, how successful Marwan are you when you try and have a discussion with po about politics with somebody? Woo, boy, uh, you know that that's a. Uh, it depends on who the conversation is with. It depends on what the whether top, they agree with you. <laughs> yeah, whether they agree with me. Um, so it can be it can be difficult, right? How about religion? How's that work out for you? Uh, that works out halfway decent, typically, because I usually don't have a conversation about religion with folks that uh, I would say that are in the same camp, right? If you're atheist, right. or agnostic, or Catholic, or we don't tend to get into dialogue in that way, um, only because I, I think for me it, it's a... Um, it's a divisive point, right? It's you mm -hmm. believe what you believe, I believe what I believe. If we need to have that conversation and go there, we can. But I don't find myself in that situation, you know, too often. So you agree that politics and religion can be divisive subjects? Oh, yeah, absolutely. So what if we put those aside for the purpose of connecting with your neighborhood? I That's difficult. I don't know if that can be done. Well, it's difficult, but what if you talk about them? Talk about things that are of human, mutual human value to each of you. But that's part of the human value, right? If we're looking at at, at religion, right? Uh, it, I have a quote, you know, in the Bible that says, you know, when I was naked, you clothed me; when I was hungry, you fed me. Right? You could say, well, that's just a human uh, being a humanist. Uh, but everyone may not feel that way. Some people may feel like pull yourself up from your bootstraps, right? That's their ide ideology. So uh, what if we what if we train people to refocus the conversation every time it starts going there too? But does that put food on your table? Let's talk about actually getting food on your table. Let's talk about helping your 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 wallet survive the rising prices of food. Let's help your family's nutritional value overcome shortages of food. I don't, so I'm, I'm confused because there are people who they are able to put food on their table and they are able to, mm -hmm. you know, decide what nutritional value of the food that they consume is. So when you're having that conversation, that's where the, the communication breaks down. Right. I'm able to do this. I do this. They should be able to do that. Right. Right. And but it's getting harder all the time. So I mentioned this. I don't think you were here for the last couple of times when I talked about this. Last two weeks ago, we had a Category 3 hurricane on the west in the, uh, in the Pacific and in the east in the Atlantic on either side of the Panama Canal. Panama Canal has been shorting, uh, slowing shipping down because they're running out of fresh water due to a drought that is allowing them to fill the canal. So the canal, the boats aren't going through the canal anywhere near as fast because they don't have the water to fill the canal, which they're mm -hmm. filling with fresh water. And then the, each time that they, they fill the canals. And, and so everything's slowing down because of that. Uh, apparently, um, the Suez Canal has had some uh, uh, political um, issues going on. And we aren't getting olive oil out of Europe. There are uh, the growing seasons throughout the southeast and, and the west in, in the United States have been disastrous this year. So there will be less produce available to us and less food going through processing. So yes, people have been able to put food on the table, but it's going to get harder and harder and harder. Part of what we do here is to develop resiliency in communities and help them be able to continue to provide food. And so yeah. that's what we do. We, we have that conversation first. Well, I hear what you're saying. And I think for me, where the, because you asked me, Mm -hmm. just earlier about conversations with religious or, or politics, right? Yeah. So where I see the disconnect is with is the haves, the have-nots, and the I kind of have it, but I'm starting to struggle, right? And the folks that typically make the decisions for our our city, our county, for our nation are folks are, that are in the haves category, yes. right? 
So that's where the disconnect is. It's like, well, you know, it's getting harder and harder to put food on your table. And for them, it's a zero sum game, right? Because it's like, hey, I, me and mine are doing just fine. So mm-hmm. what you're proposing, in my mind, I'm hearing take something from me to give it to them. No, this is something like, let's talk about food. Let's do a community garden and everybody in the community benefits from the food. Okay, so what are the costs on um, a taxpayer to do such a thing? No, it's a, it's a cost on the neighborhood. And I'm betting people in your neighborhood, as we've already discussed, are already doing that. So if you go out and you buy $10 worth of seeds and work with the people in your community to grow more food and everybody shares in the food and everybody puts $10 in, suddenly you have several hundred dollars worth of food over the summer. Well, where are we putting these gardens? Well, you talk to your neighbors about the people already having a garden and asking them if they'd be willing to expand it. How about all those lawns in front of the houses that take, uh, you know, take water uh, and maintenance that could suddenly be producing food? Okay, but part, part of the part, ta- part of the conversation we train people to have is to talk about changing people's perspective on front yard lawns and to maybe doing food instead. And then right. the whole community, you know, community people in the community come and help weed. People come in the community help, you know, a little bit at a time, and everybody benefits. That sounds good. And here's where the where the, where it breaks down. What is it? More than forty percent of residents here are renters, right? So yep. now you need to get the homeowner to agree to that. You see what I'm saying? And many are like, "Well, we don't want that. You can't have a grill inside." Uh, we were talking about this a few months ago in the summer, right? Yeah. Uh, no, you can't water your grass. Uh, so things like that. So yeah. how do you overcome that? Because that's that's where the... Together. That's the point of bringing people together. It's a, it's the, 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 the gardens are the starting point. You, I mean, you're taking people who've never worked together and don't even think about it, and you're teaching them to work together with a mutual benefit uh, out of it is the food. Okay. And then you start talking about other things that are important, like, well, how do we expand this? Or, you know, my water bill just doubled or my power bill just doubled. What can we do? So, as I said, we will be talking about all of the projects, but all of the projects are on the table until this one works. Because this is the power that create all of the other projects. We're back to we the people. Yes, I know that's a worn and tired statement, but our you talked about politicians having, but when you have people coming together and telling the politicians, well, you may have, but we do not, and we have a voice, we want this changed. And that is exceedingly difficult. And I'm speaking from experience because I'm well, going. Yeah, yeah, it is, but you have, and it takes time to do, but it's the only way anything's ever changed. So you get connected neighborhoods, you build networked communities, and you create grassroots change. That's the way it's done. And when, you, when, when you're when talking to people who have no idea what you're talking about, you go back to talking about gardens. I'm, I'm just absorbing it. I'm just trying to take it in. I don't want to derail the conversation. Okay, so we'll go with this one. It's a little bit different picture of the whole thing is you have a connected neighborhood and then you have a lot of connected neighborhoods. Now, do you think democracy works? Not our democracy, but democracy in general. (laughs) (laughs) The concept of democracy, not what the fuck is going on. (laughs) Yeah, you're going to have to beep that one out. Sorry. Um, (laughs) what's going on in DC right now, which is dysfunctional, but isn't it always, um, yeah, that's hilarious. two days away from a government shutdown, you know, what can I say? And I don't um, think we can avoid it. Do you? Well, Senate just basically put a budget together in two days and said, this is what we're going to vote on. And they're looking at the house going, you can do whatever you want to do, but you're going to have to deal with this because this has to happen. Uh, I was watching Bo the fifth column, and he says the difference between the Senate and the House is the Senate are grown ups. Are they? Who is the Senate? Who is the ones that put the budget together in two days? Yes. How are and there is the- no there are no divisive things in the budget at all. How are they, they the grown ups? 
because they put it together while the House is still talking about we need to, you know, put an impeachment for Biden in there to and put all this political stuff. It's a budget to run the country and keep it functioning. Just why leave the politics they, out of it. Why are they putting together a budget two days before the shutdown? Because the House hasn't done it yet. The House is responsible to do this. And the House has been unable to with their infighting. And the Senate usually just approves it and we have a budget. It's the House's job, and they have not been able to do it. So let's go back to the question. Let's, let's move off of that and go back to the question. <laughs> okay. Do you, do you think the democracy in general as a concept works? A representative, con as a representative yeah. government. Yes. So this slide is democracy in action on a local grassroots layer. You get a neighborhood connected. The neighborhood goes through this process of figuring out what's important over time. They bring in a representative. The representative goes to a larger group, a community group, and they start the same process again because each one of the each one of the people coming from the neighborhoods have a different set of priorities than the rest of them. So they go through it. And they go back to their neighborhood and they do representation like it's supposed to be done. And then you create from that. You end up with a, a scaled grassroots community engagement. So you say, well, you know, we're really tired of dumping sewage into the uh, into Dyes Inlet or into Sinclair Inlet or into the Hood Canal or into the, the Sound. We would like you to change your technology of doing this so that the stormwater piece is separate forever from the sewage piece, mm. which is predominantly what causes that. Um, we are tired of having our power go out while we're on a farm, uh, you know, we have a large rural community here. So I'm going to use a rural example because it's most poignant. We have a well and when the power goes out, our water doesn't pump up. And so we have no water to water the horses or shower or flush our toilets or do anything because the power went out. Uh, and it's been out for two days. And so we haven't showered or watered the animals or done anything for two days because the power's out. We have all electric heat and it's winter and our power went out and we're cold and it's been out for three days. And this is not an uncommon thing, but to your point about the haves and have nots, I talked to a former city council person. They said, well, I happen to be on the hub of three different, uh, um, power sections so we never have a power outage well mm -hmm. good for you but they're the mass majority of people in this county deal with one day uh, six hour to three or four days without power frequently during the winters well and that, that really just kind of speaks to my point right is what is the how do you build the community quote unquote and stimulate that that conversation where it is a win-win well because you listen to what the community finds important and you tie it back to what we're doing no 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 i mean in regards to the gentleman or uh the, the city council person we talked about yes okay so you see that big green blob over here uh-huh how many people would it take to elect you in your district how many people how many people are likely to vote in your district and how many people would it take to elect you? Oh man, I think uh it's like eleven hundred or something like that. So what if two thousand people are on, on board in your in your in your district to um see things change and you're saying, Well, it doesn't bother me, why should I worry about it? How long do you think you'd have your seat? Well, let me, let me put it this way, because this is what's actually happening right now when we talk about the uh, unhoused on NL King and Broadway, right? Yeah. The, the city, um, the citizens, I would say, are, I want to say they're split. You know, they, they don't want it in their neighborhood, but they want mm -hmm. something done about it, right? So both sides are in agreement there. But there's a split in how to go about providing services for that population of people, right? And so what you have is both sides coming to city council 
in in between the weeds, they're saying the same thing, but it looks like it's a, a divisive thing from a community aspect, right? There's two big blobs of green to use the, the example on the screen mm -hmm. and they're in conflict as they're, they're talking with city council and to the mayor, right? And then Perfect. there's also that same thing with city council and the mayor. Now I'm trying to uh, express it in a way where we're actually both on the same side. But of course, it's a very triggering and an emotional situation, especially if you're negatively impacted by the un unhoused population. And there will be a whole lot of that going on as things get worse. Oh, man. The, so the whole point about this model here is that you've already had that conversation in your neighborhood. You've already had the conversation about the causative effects and you are starting to say, well, how can, okay, so I just watched a, a TV show that blew my mind. It's not on anymore, but there was a TV series uh, a few years ago called New Amsterdam. And they're screening mm. it on on, um, on uh, Netflix. Okay. And the very first episode, the new director of medicine for this hospital comes in and brings all of the, the department heads and everything else in. And the first words out of his mouth is, how can I help? And I sat here with my mouth opened, thinking <laughs> about the power of that approach. How can I help? What would help you service your patients better? How can I help? And it just, uh, it, the, the whole concept of that, which is, is kind of ingrained in what we do here, is so we, we, we bring neighborhoods together and they say, well, how can I help? How can I help you have more food on your table? How can I help you if you're struggling? How can I help you get through what's happening and what's going to happen? And we want to engender that thinking. Now, what if those conversations didn't happen before they went to city council and the green blob going to city council already understood that everybody was on the same page for the most part about the homeless, but the, but the situation and the cure for homelessness can't happen with a magic wand. It has to happen with a change in how we approach the problem, but we have right. to recognize the problem first and we have to come together and have those hard discussions, and it can't be in a city council meeting. Well, that's who is, has to make the change, right? No. They, they don't have the authority to make the change that needs to happen. They have the authority to address situational things and tactical things that are happening now. But to change the way homelessness is addressed, that's a much bigger picture, and people have to come together because, after all, that's democracy. I'm not understanding what you're saying to me right now. Okay, so homelessness is a cause of the loss of jobs, the loss of housing, the cost of housing. Um, it is a, a an issue with how broken our society is and the way people have to deal with that brokenness by either using drugs or not having good mental health. Um, and we don't have enough resources. The city okay, stop council... There. Stop, there. stop there. Okay. So now that, so this goes back to the conversation and definitions, right? Mm -hmm. So that's your perspective on what you think is the cause of homelessness. For Part, folks, part of, a fraction of. All right. So, but that's what you stated, right? That's part of. The yeah. other side of that, the other people are saying, you know what? It's people that have made poor decisions. Drug use is a choice. And, you know, we, they need to, figure it out but that's not our problem right not not my monkey not my circus so that's what you're dealing with don't steal my line <laughs> i have to <laughs> i've been waiting a while to use that one i've been it's been in my pocket <laughs> but it is in, in in essence with 46 percent of the people in this country one paycheck away from homelessness it's everybody's monkey and everybody's circus and it but, wouldn't it be a, wouldn't it be a bitch to find out about homelessness and the causes of homelessness by suddenly being homeless I'm not hearing that, right? The people, no, you're not, because you're hearing people who are afraid of what they're seeing. That 
but that's what I'm saying. So that is the that's the issue, right? You saying mm-hmm. that is someone who I'm 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 expressing their viewpoint right now. That doesn't mm-hmm. resonate with them at all. I don't so, care if I'm one paycheck or two paychecks away. I don't want to have to deal with this. Right. I get it. But that's the point about learning how to communicate and listening to what they say. We have one hour to have this conversation. So I am not given the grace of leading you through a conversation and finding a place, finding a place where we can actually end up having a meaningful conversation about that. We have to do this in a compressed time frame. Solutions take time. They take listening and they take education, but not education where I'm going to teach you why you're wrong. You're saying, well, what about this? Well, what about this? How about this? And getting people to engage in thinking through the process instead of just being afraid of it and attacking it. Again, how do you do that, right? I, I don't know. I need to go to work. I need to spend time with my family. I shouldn't have to deal with this, right? This is I'm a taxpayer. Mm-hmm. So fix it. I don't have time to come in and sit in town halls and have these conversations over and over again, right? These people are breaking the law. These people have made their own decisions. Are they? Are they breaking the law? Again, this is my viewpoint, right? If you're using illegal illicit drugs, right? If you're assaulting people, if you're uh, using the bathroom public, uh, what is that? Public exposure, public indecency, whatever they call it, yeah. right? So, are, so are they all? Are they all using? Yeah, right. uh, are they all using illegal drugs? Uh, enough of them are. Well, how much is enough of them? Where where is that information? Because I'd I'd really like to know what you're what you're seeing here. So, can you tell me where you get that information so I can go review it? Eighty percent, eighty percent are using illegal drugs. Yep, from the point in time count. And if you and if you walk down the street, you can see it. Okay, and so that's breaking a lot. How many of them are uh, indecent, indecently exposing themselves? Uh, almost all of them, because if there's no. Uh place to go to the bathroom they're doing it out in public which you do have now downtown though i note that uh the city is not going to give down the ten thousand dollars for it that was expected to service them well that's a that's an ongoing battle uh which is one of the reasons why i had to take that emergency phone call so <laughs> uh that that's ongoing did you did, uh, just a, a, a side question? Having just done the grant for the KCR, did you guys do a grant for um, for supporting the the toilet center? No. Okay. That would have been a good idea, but no. Okay. Um, so, are you guys? I'm going to take a side step here because fixing problems is important and indecent exposure can frequently be fixed by having toilets down there, correct? And need to now need to be maintained. Do you have a GoFundMe site or a, a fundraising site that people can donate money to? Yes. Can you put that up here so people who are watching the show can see that? Yeah. Let me try to find it before we're done and I'll put it up there. Okay. Um, because I think that's this is the, the conversation. People don't want to see indecent exposure. You have a fix that, that has been implemented for a good portion of that particular issue. Yes, but the the goalpost gets moved because if you provide bathrooms to folks, then you are giving them a luxury, and that is not going to encourage them uh, to fix their situation, right? It's just going to draw more people to that area. This this is what okay. I'm hearing verbatim from people. So Yeah, I understand that, and... Sometimes you have to push back saying, and how are they going to fix it anyhow when there aren't opportunities and resources to do so? There aren't the jobs out there. The jobs numbers are about $15 an hour jobs when rent requires you to have a $30 an hour income to pay rent. So how are we going to get people housed when the jobs are out there paying a half of what you need to, to pay to live in a, uh, live in a place? Again, not my monkey, not my my circus, right? But I you want, but you want it to go away without having any responsibility for it. No, I don't want to be negatively impacted by it, right? And I am a taxpayer, and we do have a one tenth of one percent that's earmarked for mental health and and whatnot, right? I'm paying my taxes. A, a whole a whole one tenth of one percent. Hey, this this is what we the people voted on, and yeah. that was hard to pass. So. We have a situation where we have people 
who are want the, the homelessness problem solved. So here's one way that the city council can solve it, that this model would, would benefit. You were saying that the city council, I mean, I saw the all of the, the, the places that people can camp now, according to it was on the proposal. Um, this corner here, a whole 10 feet here and there, this gravel driveway between two houses, this, this, and this there. With all of the property the city has, isn't there some place that is a little bit more beneficial that that could happen? Uh, there, there are, there were a bunch of properties that were earmarked that the city owns, right? Yes. And that caused a lot of angst and uh, anger from community members because some of those places are in their neighborhoods, right? One of those places is five houses from me on the corner, as an mm -hmm. example, right? Yeah, I saw that. And so it's just uh, it, it's just becoming a situation of you moving it from one place to another where I'm not impacted, but now you're going to impact me. So no, I don't want it, right? So, I don't want it. So I get the, the push to have an immediate solution, but maybe if there's just a little more thought and engagement, and the people the people who are just want it to go away because it impacts them negatively by seeing homeless people, and understand, I lived in Berkeley in the 70s and 80s, I saw lots of homeless people uh, because uh, President of the United States basically closed down all the mental inst publicly funded mental institutions and let the people out. And that was the start of, of our awareness of it a long time ago. This problem has been going on for a very long time. So maybe we need to engage in a different conversation about with Kids Have Transit about uh, being able to provide transportation, uh, to talk to the city about an area that's not so centrally located to where we could put up facilities to help the, the people function and that we can actually care for them in some one way or another. Because in the end, what people, everyone seems to be calling for is a, a way to warehouse them, right? Uh, pretty much. Yeah. So maybe focusing on a way to do that uh, and so until the, address, the situation can be uh, uh, a approach differently. Rock the block. Okay. You have PayPal, you have uh, cash app. And I'll put those okay. in the chat. I just wanted to bring that up. The, what the page is their uh, rock the block. So I, I, I guess their voice is probably a uh, kind of like a GoFundMe type thing yes. for, for so social I, issues. Yep, so I just want to put it up so you can see the logo. You know you're in the right place if you see Rock the Block. Okay. And I'll put that in the chat so people can have access to that later and go back to this. Okay. So um, let's move on to the next one because we've talked about this pretty much. But next, I would like to talk to Con. Where, oh, there we go. Okay, so, Yeah. Everybody brings a jigsaw puzzle piece. Some are more frustrating than others because, you know, some of those pieces just don't want to fit into a community piece because they're, they they think that it's all individual. Um, but the point is we are all pieces to a jigsaw puzzle and we have to find a way to listen to each other and to figure out solutions. And it's not easy. It's not going to happen in an hour on this conversation. It's going to happen over time. And some people will never engage, but that's what tipping points are about. 20% is all you need to engage to change everything. If people started moving together in a positive direction toward creating a real solution, everybody else would go, oh, well, somebody's dealing with this, so I don't have to think about it anymore. And that takes care of a lot of the argument. But we're all part of the puzzle, and we have to have a puzzle that is inclusive and diverse. And that's what this model is about. We don't have to agree. We don't even have to particularly like each other. But we have to work together to create a more benefit, mutually beneficial way of living. Okay. And why do we? What do we get from that? Well, first of all, if you do the community garden, you get food. You get nutritious food. You get food that's grown locally. Even if it's only four months a year, you get food that's grown locally, and that benefits you with the prices of food having gone up 30 40% in the last seven months. 
uh, that gives you a break in your wallet. It may not be a lot, but it's at least some help to the to 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 your your wallet. Um, you have people that get trained in CPR, or somebody in your neighborhood's a nurse. If something happens, that person knowing you and having a community can help you get through whatever it is, or get to where you need to be to be taken care of. Um, if someone's an auto mechanic and someone's a tax accountant, trade skills, you know, uh, everybody needs help with taxes. And, and Marwan, I don't know if you saw the one that I sent you the other day, uh, from into it. Oh yes, 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 yes. I did watch that. What was your thought of that? And tell them, tell the, uh, tell, tell our, our audience what that was about. So, in, in that article, the part that was confusing me is it sounded like Intuit has their um, lobbyists going to uh, the politicians and saying, hey, if you try to make filing for your taxes free, uh, that is going to negatively impact the black community, right? Yes. Okay. And so... Uh, what they want to do to me is it sounds like they want to still keep their hand in the pocket, right? And so that's their way to do that. We've seen this where um, companies that uh, bottle Coca-Cola and Nestle and some others, forgive me on the Nestle, I, I'm not sure about Nestle, but definitely Coke, uh, also were lobbying NAACP and black orgs to say, hey, these foods, it's actually racist to try to tell black people what they should and shouldn't eat, even though what it was was advocating for nutritious, nutritious options. But they're saying, no, 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 people should be able to make those choices themselves, right? Uh, so it's a really insidious uh, practice to continue to gouge under the guise of, you know, this is actually harmful to a, a, a community. Okay, so I'm going to give you the other piece. And now the rest of the story as Paul Harvey used to say. <laughs> so, and I want to give tribute to Paul Harvey. It's he, If any of you don't know who he is, go find something on YouTube because it's brilliant. Um, okay, so I went to file the Resilient Ecosystems taxes this year. And I went to the login that I normally use. And it said, oh, you have to create a new login to make sure you're you using a program that is not a government agency, but a, but a third party uh, private company called ID me. I went, okay, whatever. And I started down that process. And very shortly, the intrusive amount of information they want from my personal financials, uh, social security numbers and everything else, which is the IRS already has to prove it's me. So I can log in. I stopped and I went, this is the things, these are the types of things that people say never put out on the internet. And that is nobody's damn business. And yet this third party business oh. is going to get all of this information from you so you can log into uh, IRS yes. so you can file your taxes for free. Oh, my, Marwan, turn your mic off. Thank you. We were just reviewing with them and they were reviewing the case. Okay, well, we'll keep we'll keep going down this path. All right, so swinging back to that, the IRS is making it very difficult for you to use their service to log in and file for free. This is just another uh, political method, or not political, but corporate method of lobbying to make it more difficult for us to use tools that are provided from the federal government. Um, and they're using spurious arguments that there are very, very little actual data on to um, keep this going so that they can make massive amounts of money to provide services to you uh, that the government would provide for free. So uh, moving on with this, um, we're almost done actually. So why would you want to do this? I mean, we just showed you the good stuff. Uh, community, breaking bread, um, working together, gardening together, uh, being able to make decisions about things that, that are important and creating political uh, leverage to get them done uh, because politicians pay attention to politician uh, political math. But we have a whole bunch of stuff that is about to go down, and it's already going down because of climate change. Food's going to get shorter and shorter because the growing seasons are, are, are changing um, and, the, and the growing conditions are changing. Weather's wiped out crops. 
droughts wiped out crops. Um, our overuse of water is uh, creating problems for uh, growing areas. And um, then we have our own Cascadia Rising and a whole bunch of other things, economic and social, that are going to start impacting us all. And if we don't come together and start learning how to build capacity in our own neighborhoods to learn how to help each other and provide things like food for each other and start talking to each other with each of our own perspectives, bringing our puzzle piece to the neighborhood, we're going to be on our own when catastrophe hits. And that's not a place you really want to be. So let's get over ourselves and actually start talking to each other. It is hard. Marwan is absolutely right. It is very hard. But if we have uh, this chart right here. So today we have a lot of confusion and inaction. And going back to the co-opting of words, the misuse of words, the misunderstanding of words, we have created so much confusion that people don't even know what to do. And they're looking to other people who are basically using misinformation and um, manipulation to keep us where we are. The only way to get beyond that is together. In the near future, which is today, by the way, um, we have cascading consequences. We're already seeing the, the ravaging effects of ch climate change in storms. As I mentioned earlier, we had two hurricanes, one on either side of the Panama Canal going north, one in the Pacific, one in the Atlantic, which was stopping tra uh, shipping traffic from being able to go through the Panama Canal. That's goods on our shelves. Um, Panama Canal is, is going through, the Panama is going through a massive drought. And it was from the Los Angeles Times. You can look up the article. If you go to the Kitsap Resiliency Project, I believe that article's on there. And it's talking about how Panama Canals had to slow down shipping, which means shelves are empty. Go look at your store. Shelves are empty. It doesn't take a survey or a census to figure that out. You can look for yourself. Um, so we end up in a situation where it's getting shorter and shorter in supply. And that's happening right now. So near future is today. And it's right. going to get worse. Also, we have 3% of the planet wa planet's water is fresh and drinkable. Most of that's in ice shelves and Arctic ice sheets, which is now melting into the ocean because of the, uh, the, the climate change. So where are we heading in five to 10 years? Planned and unplanned consequences. If we aren't working together and figuring stuff out together, you know, we're, it's, it's grab, bend over and grab your socks. I'm waiting for Marwan to laugh at that one. <laughs> there we go. Um, I didn't know if that was insert laugh there, you know? Yeah, insert laugh there. Okay, <laughs> so um, the way to get through this is to come together, to have the difficult conversations. And it doesn't even have to be everybody. As I say, tipping points is 20% of the people. 20% of the people, 25% at the, at the most to move quickly. 25% of the people start doing something together everyone else will follow along. This is how change happens. Don't believe me? Talk to Princeton University. Talk to, you know, Yale, people who have done the studies on this. And this is how things work. But it starts with the neighborhood. And yes, it is very difficult conversations. And no, it is not going to happen overnight. It's generational work. But we can make major hurdles in a year if we start talking. Otherwise, we can just sit around in confusion and inaction and let it all happen. And that's always worked so well for us in the past. You know, I'm with you. I just, um, and, and we do need to do that, right? I mean, it's just a, it's just good to, to get grounded in that way. My concern is we're watching this on both sides, right, uh, from a macro level, uh, level nationally where we're so far apart on things um, and how do we begin to, to do that, right? When you look at democracy and how it's supposed to work, we, we have our election uh, and even when uh, one side has all three levers of power, uh, there's still- They don't do anything. <laughs> it, 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 that, exactly my point, right? Yeah, you don't get reelected by doing anything because somebody will point at it and say that's a bad thing. Right, and, and we've created this, so we have to bring the, the we have to bring democracy back down to a local level. We have to educate people in democracy. 
we have to empower them by having these conversations. And you're right, it is not easy. And it is not going to happen overnight. And you're going to have people who argue till they're blue in the face. And hopefully, therefore, they you know get asphyxiated and drop over dead. But um, but we can talk things through if we keep it away from divisive subjects. And what is less divisive than having a barbecue? By the way, these are Marwan's folks from G2 um, putting on a community barbecue in Viewcrest Village last year. And we did this to get people talking to each other. Yeah, they were out there burning, turning, and burning. And yep. and don't forget Terry there in the background. Yeah. Yeah, Terry and I kind of like bridged the gap between G2 and, and Resilient Ecosystems. We do a little of both. So anyway, this is um, this is what we need to do. That's what Community for All is. Now, we'll get more into it later. But as you can see, without successfully starting to build Community for All, we will not have the will to do the rest of it. And yeah. you don't have to buy into everything. I mean, we're not talking communism here. And, uh, you know, I'm not going to grow my beard big and white and, you know, start wearing a Marxist hat. What we're talking about it's working together and supporting each other, which, by the way, is how humans work. It's how we've always worked when we're at our best. And now we're at 202, so I've run over by two minutes. I'm sorry. No, no, that's all good. You know, I haven't been here in a minute. I'm just putting these uh, places where folks can make donations if they so feel inclined. Uh, and it's more than just the porta potties. So, uh, hygiene kits. Uh, right now we have someone that's on the block who is wheelchair bound, who is, should be going into surgery today. Uh, so we are taking people to the hospital. We are showing up in court with them uh, and trying to advocate for them, trying to get folks guardianship uh, for those that need it, that can't uh, either have mental health issues or elderly or have some physical limitations Right, they're they're not going to be able to go to work and and sustain housing and pay bills and things like that. Right, there's a a large contingent of folks that are experiencing uh, homelessness that are in that situation. Uh, so going to court on their behalf, trying to look up family members and trying to reconnect them with family, uh, getting folks to treatment. Right, um, the Oh, what is it called? Medical detox. Many of these uh, places are in Longview uh, or in. Port Angeles, you know, far, far away. And so those folks need transportation there when they're ready to say, hey, which I want to. Which G2 provides. Yes, yes. I we um, always come, do it. We're yeah. trying to find funding for that uh, because that that's a, a huge uh, expenditure on us, right? That takes a driver mm -hmm. out of pocket in a vehicle for more than six hours, you know, to transport one person yeah. there. And, you know, and, there's no and, budget. And, and, and more immediately, um, I drove two children to school from Broadway uh, last week. Yes. And unfortunately, uh, they are now in CPS custody because the parents were not able to um, do what they needed to do, sadly. So, yes. Uh, so, but Mark is absolutely right, right? Uh, transporting kids that are experiencing homelessness to school uh, while their parents are battling addiction. Uh, so it's a little bit of everything that's happening down there uh, to this date. We've gotten more than 24 people off of ML King and Broadway, but it takes a lot of intensive care. You know, there's someone who's still in the hospital that's been there for more than two weeks. And so we're, you know, we've got folks that are rock the block that are going to visit them. Kimmy and Kelsey and uh, Dom, Michelle. Sometimes I'm on a phone call, FaceTime with several folks talking to the to, to the because uh, I'm not going to say any names, but to to the person that was on on ML King and now is in the hospital bed, you know, getting treatment and getting help uh, and trying to keep their spirits up and you know just doing things like that. Folks are really given, and and these aren't independently wealthy people. These are people that are working full time jobs. You know, Kimmy's a, a Harborview uh, nurse. Uh, Don Michelle works in Bellevue. <laughs> Kelsey works for Kitsap Public Health. You know, these are full time employees somewhere else and then, you know, using their off time to do that. If you can hear the rain right now, uh, summer's over. 
and it it poured yesterday and it is pouring now. You don't hear it? It's not it's not hitting you. We're not too far uh, away. I'm, oh, gotcha, gotcha. I you get, get the I out. It, it's coming down, right? Uh yeah, and it was coming down yesterday, and the backing here and the front face of the uh, show was, Autumn's here, are you ready? No. Of course you're not. No, we're not ready. We're not ready. But, you know, as Maya Angelou says, still we rise. And I, I know we're a little over, but I just wanted to just, you know, I, I missed a lot because I'm doing emergency car conversations with the county, and yep. that's my surgery. Um, by the way, back just, surgery Friday. Just, yeah, just a note, turn your mic off when you do that. I, I was using the wrong mic. So I thought I was using this mic okay. the whole time I was using my default mic. So I didn't know I was still hot. Okay. okay. Um, yeah, I tried to talk loud enough to keep your privacy. <laughs> no, I appreciate private. that because that's like my, my uh, surgery schedule. So it's like, uh, okay. Uh, but this is really what that is, right? So if you look at the yellow, yeah. that would be whoever you want to put here, Marwan or, or Kimmy or Dawn, and then gathering other folks, Bailey and, and other people together and saying, hey, and then trying to push it this way and turning into the green. Uh, that That's what we're trying to do with Rock the Block. Uh, and those are the things that can be done, whether it's G2. This could be Roseco with Mark and then bringing in Terry and myself and Martita and others uh, and then trying to pull it into the green, right? So those are real examples of things that are happening today. You know, the things that we are uh, trying to teach are things that we do ourselves, right? And so you can see it in the work that we do. Uh, and we do need folks to bring their puzzle piece and expand that piece, turn that green, uh, well, make it turn into green from that orange, right? I think even the green might not be a, a, a great color. Maybe it needs to be more of a yellow. And then as it gets a little bit bigger, then it's a green or a brighter green, right? That we've made, we hit that tipping point and now we, we're, we're where we need to be. Um, but the fight's hard. It's, it's, um, it's tedious. And you have to be the one to understand your position and understand the people who you're speaking to, what their position is, right? Uh, and I, I talk about that in negotiations all the time, right? The best negotiators, you already know what your interests are. You need to know who you're negotiating against, what their interests are, and find out a way. Negotiating with. Yes, and make it a win-win instead of a zero-sum game. And if there is something that people have to sacrifice on each side, that both people are taking a little bit of a cut, but then both people are getting something out of it and finding a way to articulate that, right? That it's a it's for the greater good, and that's what we and that's what we teach. Yeah, absolutely. So I just wanted so to. So for on those that. of you who think for those of you who think Marwan just flip flopped, he didn't. He just likes to play devil's advocate to to keep this moving forward. But this is the work Marwan and I do every day. Well, and and thank you for bringing that up because what I do in in the conversations that I have is I'm constantly hearing the other side's opinion, right? So that's all I take in all day long, right? I'm fighting, I'm swimming against the stream, right? And I'm saying, hey, there's a better way. There's a different way. What What's important to you? What do you think? How do you feel? All right, how do we turn? And then we start doing this together, right? So I, I this is what I deal with. Right. And what we're trying to do is get the conversations to be had before we get into a conflictive situation where we're so polarized on either side. And if we can get communities to come together and start having those kind of conversations and seeing it from different points of view and teaching them to do that, we don't get into the conflicted pieces. We go through a process of consensus. Yeah. And if it was easy, it'd already be done, right? That's why there's a need. Yep. Rob says, yes, it is. All right. Now we are eight, eight well, nine minutes over, uh, but I did miss a little bit. I wanted to give my... And we had two short ones. <laughs> <laughs> so put that in there. Uh, give you the final word. Um, you know, I guess I'm going to quote the Beatles. Come together. Right now? Is that how the song yep. goes? All right. That's Over me. <laughs> no, wait. <Whoa. laughs> that just, that just, right. well, that just took a turn. <laughs> hey, everyone, this is a family show. <laughs> All right. No, it's not. We don't. We, we suggest <laughs> not for kids. <laughs> Uh, well, it's good to end with a little smile and a laugh. So for Mark Boatwright Frost, I am R1 Cameron. This is Tipping Points and Puzzle Pieces. We will be back on the conduit at 5 p.m. for the study session for the Bremerton City Council meeting. Uh, until then, we'll see you soon. No, no outro.